I will be your host for today. I am standing in for Sam Rhodes, who is your usual host. I think Sam is going to join us at some point during the presentation, but let's get started. We're going to introduce our presenter for today, Dorothy Hamill. Dorothy is not a stranger to PIDC. She has been our go-to subject matter expert during this two-part series. We have, we've been working on with Dorothy in this series for several years now. So I think Dorothy, this is about our fourth year at least yeah. hosting, yeah. hosting this webinar. And Dorothy has been unmatched when it comes to understanding the nuances involved with real estate acquisitions and processes. Dorothy is a partner with Cyril and Lesner, Lesner Law Firm here in the city. Um, she's been an expert working in real estate transactions for over 20 years. And she, focus, uh, she focuses, I know, you, you hate to say numbers, right? Her, her practice is focused on commercial and residential real estate financing, transactions, local zoning, and leasing. She's also experienced in collection practices and litigation, and as well as the intricacies of local government operations. So you know if any of you on this call have ever been involved in real estate transactions, it is almost impossible to do a transaction without being involved or getting involved with local government. Dorothy is an expert in helping you navigate through municipal processes, whether it's licenses, inspections, zoning matters, all of those items that are critical to the acquisition of your real estate. Dorothy has closed on the acquisition of more than 200 single family units and the debt associated with those facilities, the acquisition of an eight acre shopping center. And I will say right there that Dorothy has represented a few PIDC clients. So we can vouch for her professionalism, the high quality of her services. Um, and it is because of that, that we continue to invite Dorothy to lead this particular segment of this series. She's closed on financing for new development shopping center, zoning. She is able to obtain zoning for a 176 unit center city condominium project. And the list just goes on. And so with, with that, it is my pleasure again for PIDC to be able to have the expert advice from Dorothy Hamill real estate attorney. And so Dorothy, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marla. I mean, gosh, with all that, I feel like I really know what I'm doing. I should have Marla do my introductions to new clients all the time. Um, so hopefully, um, you know, I'll be able to answer a lot of your questions, give you a good basis for how to start. Um, it's always a daunting prospect to consider buying commercial real estate. I mean, I think everybody knows a little bit how they feel when they buy a house. And now you're talking about buying either a commercial property in order to move your business into it or a commercial property to develop or to lease, to rent, to operate. So this class will give you an overview of sort of the nuts and bolts, starting with, you know, how do I find a property? What kind of property do I want? Then, you know, how do I find it? How do I go about going from wanting it to actually getting an agreement sale for it, getting through the sale process, what contingencies might I need. Um, we'll touch very briefly on 
financing, but uh, as Marla mentioned, the class for tomorrow, I think it's uh, it would be very important and very helpful uh, to tune into that class tomorrow because obviously financing, once you find the property, financing is a critical piece unless you have cash in the bank, you're going to need to, to finance the, the, the purchase and knowing where to find that money is critical in the deal. So if we could move to the next slide, that would be great. And the next one. So, you know, my prior slide said, you know, says, is it as easy as it is on TV? And everybody knows there is a innumerable number of shows that all talk about, that are all related to flipping houses. And in 30 minutes, it looks so simple. You buy the house, you go in, even if it's in really bad condition, you have your contractor come in, you might have a bump or two in the road, and in the end, you have this beautiful house in six weeks that you can sell and you're getting, you know, more than your asking price. Well, you know, <laughs> as anybody who's in the flipping business knows, it's just not that simple. And, you know, there aren't, you know, you can't count on, oh, okay, there's going to be one, maybe two bumps in the road, but everything else will go fine. It just doesn't, doesn't typically work that way. Um, so the first, the first consideration, obviously, when you want to buy is where do I find the properties? Um, you know, you need to determine first what kind of property you want to buy, what is the intended use, is it for your own business, is it for your intention to buy it, to flip it, is it your intention to buy it and hold it, lease it, do you want to do residential, commercial? So there's a number of different places that you can look for properties. Government is certainly one of them. Uh, PRA, OHCD, the City of Philadelphia Land Bank. They, and I include PIDC in, and paid in that. They are all uh, government connected entities that uh, the RDA as well should be in there. They hold properties and have the availability to sell those properties on uh, to third parties. Now, the city of Philadelphia has been putting together the land bank process for a number of years, and it had previously been sort of a disjointed process where, you know, some people called their council person, oh, hey, I saw the RDA owns a property, or I see PIDC owns a property, I'd like to buy it. And they would get you in touch with somebody at one of the agencies to sort of move that forward. But it was always, you know, it can become problematic because two people want the same property. Somebody knows somebody, somebody doesn't know somebody. Um, so that's certainly a good place to look. Now, it's important to remember Whenever you get government involved, the process is going to be a little bit slower. It's not like going to an independent third party seller, Bob Jones or Bob Corporation, where he has total control of property, the process will be much smoother. When you're talking about a government agency, it's a slower process and you have to be prepared and you have to factor that into your timing. Because if you need more time or less time, then it's important 
that you factor that into your business plan to know that you're going to have an additional two to three month potentially potential lag in closing because it has to go through the process. Real estate brokers are obvious are an obvious source of properties. You know, it's not a bad idea in a particular area where you are interested in buying property, you know, you want to develop in rural retail. Well, it's a good idea to, you know, look around at some of the, the brokers who seem to be doing a lot of work in rural retail. Uh, talk to people. They can give you, you know, they can be a good source of information, a good source of networking for properties in an area in which you're looking to, to purchase. Sheriff sales, tax sales, uh, mortgage foreclosure sale, those are all good sources of real estate. However, I caution everybody who gets involved in a sheriff's sale, mortgage foreclosure, or is interested in getting involved in that. Because for anyone who has not been there, uh, there are people, this is what they do for a living. They go to all of the sales. They have a process. They know the, the ground rules. They know the people. And it moves fast. The process moves fast. So you have to do your homework in advance. You have to know what your budget is, what your top number is. You have to be prepared because it, as I said, it moves quickly. So the sheriff's not gonna wait for you to decide whether paying an extra 5,000 is going to work for you. You have to have done all of that work in advance so that when it comes time to go to the sale, you know what your bottom line number is. And once you hit that, you're not pressured, you don't feel uh, under the gun to make a decision on whether you're going to spend more or not. Because if you don't plan in advance, you're, you're really going to get swallowed up there and you're going to feel overwhelmed because the, the professionals are going to be there and they're speeding it along. And the sheriff, you know, typically there's a lot of properties on a particular sale list. So the sheriff's looking to move quickly. So you need to be prepared for that. The process on a sheriff sale can be a little bit slower too, because even though you close on the, you, you're the successful bidder, you put your 10% deposit down, you have 30 days to close on the sale. You know, there are opportunities in which you can uh, get an extension, but you should be prepared to be able to close in 30 days. And if you can't, then you you want to make you want to be prepared that if you absolutely positively have to close in 30 days and you cannot get an extension for the sheriff, are you going to be able to do that? You know, the extensions used to be given out uh, a little more freely. Not so much now. Not to say you can't, but you, you need to be prepared to close within the time frame that is typical. If once you close, you know, the sheriff has to prepare to be, have it signed and get recorded. Again, that can be, depending on timing, that can add an additional 30 to 60 days to your closing time. So again, that's a factor. Networking. Obviously, you, if you're if you know people who are in the flipping business and that's what you want to do, talk to them. Find out, you know, how do they find properties? Where are they looking? Do they hear of anything? You know, they you may know somebody who does a lot of develop in, in Northern Liberties, but you're really interested in uh, brewery town. It's a it's a good way 
And it's also good just for your general business development is to talk to people and find people in your own, in the area where you can talk to them about what you're doing, what your plans are, how you're planning to do it, uh, build up your network of people. We actually have a, uh, somebody in the audience, David, who has, uh, is a small business owner who has experience in acquiring property. So I thought maybe, David, if you want to jump in here for a minute and um, give a little bit of background on how you went ahead and found the property that you were looking for, uh, I think that would be helpful. Dave, if you can unmute for us, that would be great. David, are you able to unmute your mic? Yes, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. So good. I want to make sure you heard Dorothy's question, how I you didn't. came about. I Dorothy, did not. Why don't you, Dorothy, why don't you repeat your question? So I was talking about, David, how you go about finding your property that you want to buy, and I had given some you know, some places, people, where you can, how you can go about that process. So I thought it would be good for the people to hear, you know, once you decided to buy, how did you go about finding that property? So I actually, uh, well, good morning to all the panelists and good morning to all the participants. And thank you for allowing me to be on this wonderful uh, panel today. Uh, primarily, I had come from a space that was in North Philadelphia and knew that it was time for me to make a change in my business. And I just knew originally that what I was looking for, first and foremost, because I am a catering business, that I needed to find a commercial space that had a hood. Now, for those of you that do know or don't know, it's very important that you find a property that has a hood because a hood could cost you anywhere from $10,000 to $20,000 for just the hood, for just the installation and all the things that goes along with that. So my quest started there. Secondly, I looked at different neighborhoods and this space that I'm currently in um, was recommended to me by one of the constituent services uh, people that work in City Councilwoman Sherelle Parker's office. So with that being said, um, I actually knew the owner uh, of the property as well as knowing the tenant of the property, but I knew the tenant before the owner. And um, I even had the mindset of renting when I first saw the space. I was like, this would be a nice space. Um, and then I found out that it was for sale. When I found out that it was for sale, it was in a neighborhood that I wanted to be in. And I looked at the property. Um, I then began my quest of development relationship with a lender so that I could purchase this building. Okay. That's helpful. And that's good to know. Uh, and that's, we'll get into that. But when you're identifying the kind of property that you want to buy, it's important to consider those, those features. And as David said, he's a caterer, a, a hood system is very expensive. So if you can find a property that already has that in there, you know, that's a savings for you. So I think that's- um, can, I, can I add one more thing to that? Sure. So, also, what was important to me, and as I'm putting my thoughts together, not just having the hood, but knowing and doing background research and whatever it is, is what are you going to have to encounter by way of licenses and inspections? 
So with knowing that in my profession, that one of the things that the city requires um, is a plan review, I thought about not just the hood, but all of the things that in looking for a property that may be already in place or may be grandfathered in. So I wanted to have a system. I wanted to have a place that had an ansel system. I wanted to have a, a place that had a three compartment sink. I wanted to have a space that had a two compartment sink. Um, eventually parking was down on the bottom of the list, but even the location I'm at, it had a great space for me to pull my trucks up to be able to enter to the back, to not have to stop traffic on Wadsworth Avenue. Um, a lot of people don't know all of the things that go into, and that's part of what you talked about earlier at the sheriff's sale about the research, how important that is, because even down to having an existing catering business or an existing restaurant, the health department wants you to put together a plan review, even if you purchase a new refrigerator. So having those things and knowing those things and coming from a location where I had been expected from the health department or multiple different locations, I already knew some of the challenges that I may face. I knew some of the obstacles that I may face and I knew which hurdles I was willing to jump over to get to my commercial space. Great, I think that's very helpful. We, um, someone submitted a question um, which I think we'll get into a little bit more, but somebody was, um, somebody asked a question about what if you've identified your property, but the owner is looking for more than the appraised value of the property. Uh, we'll talk about that in our discussions, but in that circumstance, if you've identified the property, you know, the question then becomes, if the owner wants more than the appraised value, is it worth it? You know, does it have everything you need and it is so perfect that it's going to save you on build out or uh, installations, alterations that maybe you're paying on the front end, but it's going to save you on the back end. Uh, are you getting, you know, if you've gotten financing, is it such that the financing is so good that, you know, paying so extra for the property doesn't, isn't such a big deal because you're getting such good financing. So, you know, again, it all goes to what's the property, what does it have? And how many boxes does it tick off for me? And as David mentioned, you know, he bought a building and he knew he wanted a building that had an ANSEL system already in it because that's an expensive addition to a building. That would be a consideration if, you know, an owner is asking more, are there things in the property that make it worth you paying additional for? Rafi, I can add something to that if you like. Sure. So um, to the person that asked the question, um, that is going to be something that you have to evaluate your comfort level as far as, am I able to pay a little bit more with finance? And just my experience, my first property that I was at on Lehigh Avenue, I was in a triple merge lease. So I paid the water bill, I paid the rent, I paid the taxes. My second property on Ridge Avenue, I was in a triple merge lease. I paid the rent, I paid the taxes, I paid the mortgage. And, you know, just being very honest, from where I came from to where I'm at now, um, the property that I was at was um, a shithole. Um, and I was glad to be able to purchase my own property. And even I had some people tell me at my purchase price, the, the, actually the, one of the people that told me was the tenant before he said, oh, well, this building is not worth that amount of money. Well, I didn't pay any of that any mind because I feel as though that when I got here, 
I had 80 to 85% of what I needed. And even when I asked the owner to fix two things and the owner told the realtor, they weren't interested in fixing those two things. To me, it still was important for me to not only get this property, but where I was coming from, um, not only was, as I said, not the best of looking places, but to have employees, I didn't want my employees to not have to have somewhere to come to work every day. And because one of the things where I came from the building was structurally unsound, I jumped at this opportunity. So I say to the person that's answering the question is write down, get a piece of paper, write down the pros and write down the cons. And if the pros outweigh the cons, I say jump for joy at the pros. Perfect. Okay, if we could move on to the next one, the next slide. So here we're sort of getting into what we alluded to off of the previous slide is what type of property do you want to buy? Are you buying single family residential properties that you intend to fix up and sell? Do you want to fix up and lease? Do you want to buy into a condominium? And, you know, there's a contingent of people in the city who buy in the condominiums and lease those condominiums. Now, obviously, when you're talking about a condominium, you want to make yourself uh, very familiar with the condominium declaration that goes with that property. And the declaration is the document that gets filed which establishes the condominium and then governs how the condominium operates. And with a condominium, you're going to have, in addition to your other traditional costs, you're going to have mo monthly assessments for common expenses. And those are the kind of expenses to, to upkeep the shell of the building, the windows, the common areas, which would be uh, lobbies, elevators, any amenity areas in the building, uh, you know, a gym, a pool, anything like that. Um, and with the condominium, you also have to consider that there are, there can be special, special assessments, which are assessments to make a capital repair and a capital repair is something that's uh it, that's a an accounting term but it basically means a significant improvement to the building a new roof new windows a new elevator and in doing that depending on how the condominium has been operating you know they might not have a lot of money in reserve so now they're going to have to do an assessment of all the unit owners, which is in addition to your monthly assessment. So a condominium is, has other considerations uh, when you're doing your, your due diligence. With residential, there is, you know, do you want an apartment building? Do you want a multi-unit row home, a brownstone, a duplex? Again, we'll get into this in, in the due diligence, but if these are the things you want to do, you're going to have to take a look at, you know, what is it now? Is the use permitted? And if it's not permitted, what do I, what am I going to need to do to get it permitted? Commercial, a, you know, you can have a <coughs> single property you're buying just for yourself. It's going to be a single owner occupant that's going to be you or you're going to buy it to lease it to multiple residential tenants uh, mixed use you have a lot of that in the city where you have commercial on the first floor residential on the upper floors again there are considerations to that type of property as well industrial uh, there are certain areas in the city where industrial was uh, predominantly 
situated, you know, that's sort of shifted as there's not as much industrial in the city, but there is still some pockets of it in the city. So if you are looking for industrial property, you're going to want to look particular, particularly in those areas and make it land. Uh, you know, there is, you wouldn't think it, but there is a good bit of uh, vacant land in the city, uh, particularly in, uh, in residential areas where uh, properties have been either demolished, uh, either by the owners or by the city because they haven't been maintained. Uh, again, when looking at vacant land, you know, in a certain sense, people look at that and think, oh my gosh, that's awesome. I can do whatever I want. Well, you know, that's not exactly the case because you have to look at the zoning, what's around it, um, before you make a consider, before you think that, uh, uh, can you, whether you consider buying a piece of vacant land or not. So uh, let's move on to the next slide. Thank you. So the next consideration is, you know, we're talking about buying commercial real estate, but the question you need to ask before you get to that is what, if you're buying for your business, what makes sense? Does it make sense for me to buy? Am I a new business? Am I established business? Well, if I'm a new business, you know, may, you may not want to take the risk because you have startup costs, you may say, you know what, let me get into a lease, see how it goes for the next five years, and then I can reevaluate. And it depends on the type of business that you are that will determine what sort of lease you want to enter into, whether it's longer term, shorter term, you know, obviously all governed by the negotiations with the landlord, but if you're an established business and you've been somewhere and you're like, look, you know, I'm paying rent, I'm paying these other costs, I feel like I'm established enough, I can, you know, I'm comfortable branching out, looking for my own place, that way I'm building equity in my own building and not paying it to somebody else. So, and where you establish yourself you know, we talk about location. You know, are you really a center city business, but you're going to start out leasing or operating on the outskirts of center city because you're, you're getting a better rent, um, but you really think your business long-term plan for success is better suited for a more center city location? Are you better in the you know North Broad corridor? What is your business plan? What is your model? What makes sense? And that's the very start before you get into I want to buy. If you're if you're buying for your own business, you really need to consider what your business plan is. Look at your plan, write it out, know where you want to be, and then you can move forward in determining whether buying or leasing is right for you. Now, as part of that, you're, you're doing an analysis. You're looking at how much is it going to cost me to buy versus how much is it costing me to rent. You know, a lot of buying costs, they're a one-time cost. They're significant, but you know, rent, you're paying monthly to somebody else, you're paying base rent, and you're paying triple net costs. Now, in it, most commercial leases are triple net leases, which means not only are you paying base rent, you're paying a proportionate share of the real estate taxes and other assessments imposed on the building. You're paying percentage of the insurance costs that the owner incurs to insure the building and you're paying if it's a building that has multiple commercial tenants 
you're paying a share of the operating costs that the landlord incurs for the common areas of that building. Uh, the elevators, cleaning, uh, those insurance, I mentioned that, uh, any sort of uh, landscaping that might be done inside the building, those kind of things, you're paying a percentage of that. So you have to look at those costs and determine, okay, you know, is that going to work? What's going to cost me more? What makes more sense? So, you know, as I always say, the first order of business is knowing your, your finances. And once you know your finances and you have a handle on them, that's when you start looking at options for buying, leasing, moving, things like that. So let's move on to the next slide, please. Do I need a lawyer? So, you know, people will say, well, of course you say yes, you're a lawyer. And I would probably say the same thing. But I do think that there is, particularly when you were talking about commercial real estate, I think that it is important to have an experienced an attorney who guides you through the process because they can help you determine whether this is a good move for you, whether the numbers for what you may be looking at, whether they make sense with what your plan is. Now, you're doing that in conjunction with your tax professional because your tax professional is going to say, look, this doesn't make sense. You know, you want to do this instead. Let's try this first. Uh, you know, you're moving too quickly, not quickly enough. You know, those kind of things. But you want somebody, particularly when you're talking about buying property that may need, you know, uh, to go through some sort of city process, zoning, um, PIDC, PRA, RDA, all of these uh, quasi-government agencies. You want to have somebody who knows what to do. Well, certainly these, uh, these resources are wonderful and they have some phenomenally wonderful people in them who will help you. In the end, they, you know, ultimately they have to make sure that they're following their guidelines for their particular agencies. You want somebody who's totally unaffiliated, whose only goal and interest is to protect you. How do you find a lawyer? Well, you know, it's, it's not easy to just, you know, despite all the information on the internet, it's not like, oh, well, I'll just go type in real estate lawyer. And, you know, you'll get 5,000 hits on the internet because you're going to have people who, you know, dabble in real estate, people who, who, uh, who do know real estate, but they're not familiar with Philadelphia, but they're more uh, familiar with Bucks County. And, you know, those things can matter. Uh, you know, in certain counties, Having somebody who is a local who practices there all the time, who's known to people, can make the difference. You know, we've seen this on a number of occasions in um, Bucks County. You know, zoning is tough in some of these counties, and having somebody who does zoning all the time in these counties can make all the difference as opposed to, you know, somebody who's done two zoning matters in the county in the last three years. You know, having that resource can be very critical. Um, talking to friends, family, you know, people in your network, have you used anybody? Do you know anybody? Do you know anybody who knows anybody? I mean, as lawyers, we do the same thing. You know, people, People will call me, you know, can you do my will? Or I fire my employee, do I have to be worried? Well, that's not my area. I don't practice in that. And, you know, while 
I have some very loose knowledge. I don't want somebody making a decision based on my loose knowledge. I want them to talk to somebody who does this all the time. So if I don't personally know someone, I reach out to my friends and colleagues and say, hey, do you know somebody who is a labor lawyer who can handle a social security disability claim? That way I'm putting people in touch with somebody who really knows the process and knows the information. And don't hesitate, you know, I think sometimes people feel intimidated, like, oh, well, I, you know, I don't want to bother people or I don't want to waste time or, you know, which is certainly a consideration. Look, you don't want to call a lawyer and spend an hour or two, you know, of their time and say, nah, you know, I, I'm not going to use you and do that, you know, to multiple people because, you know, obviously lawyers bill on time. That's a, you know, that's a lot of time to give, but you also, th there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, look, I'm new to this. I just started, you know, I want to get your, I want to get your thoughts on it. We, you know, what your experience is. Ask them questions. There's nothing wrong with, you know, you're going to buy a new refrigerator. You do research. The same thing is, is true with a lawyer. Call them. See how you interact with them. You know, part of a attorney-client relationship is the relationship. How how do you relate to that person? Do you find them standoffish? Are they too chatty? Are they, you know, unresponsive? Do they not seem knowledgeable? I mean, those things are important. So you want to you want to feel comfortable with who you choose, so that if something comes up you feel free to just pick up the phone and say, hey, look, this thing, this thing came up. What do you think? So, you know, again, having a lawyer can make all the difference in, in a smooth transaction or helping you through a difficult transaction. So I think we can move on to the next. Perfect. Thank you. So, you know, people, you'll get different people tell you different things about doing the letter of intent. And the letter of intent is non-binding. It's basically you sitting down with either the owner, the bro a broker for the owner, and outlining the basic deal terms. You know, how, what, what am I exactly buying? How much is it? You know, how much of a deposit are you going to require? What sort of due diligence do, do I want to do? And the due diligence really means your inspections. You know, how much time am I going to have to do everything that I need to do? And the amount of time you need is going to depend on what you want to do. And in a commercial deal, if you're buying a single family to... to uh, repair, restore, flip, your time period is probably going to be short. Your time period is certainly going to be shorter. If you're doing new development, your time period is going to be longer because there is a process to that. There is, uh, you know, getting zoning, getting approvals, getting plans drawn. And you want to make sure that you're clear on your time frame so that you know when you're negotiating you're not shorting yourself and so that when you go to sign the agreement of sale or you're negotiating and you say oh you know i know i said 120 days but i really need 200 days well you know that's probably not going to go over as well with an owner if you spend time negotiating a letter of intent now some people will say eh, don't bother with the letter of intent, just go straight to an agreement of sale. Um, it really depends on the situation and, and who's on the other side. Uh, if you're still working, at, if you have an interest in the property, but you're still sort of trying to work out your, your numbers, your, your process, what you're doing, a letter of intent may be a good idea because it's allowing you to flesh out a little bit more and, and prod you into thinking a little bit more about, you know, what you need or what you can expect. 
condition of title is is very important because obviously you, you want to get the property free and clear of any liens or encumbrances. Now you're going to get title insurance, and we'll talk about that further. But you know the bottom line is nobody wants to put in a title plan. Like you you want to buy being very clear about what affects that property and giving yourself enough time to have a title company do a proper search, give you the information that you can review with your, uh, your partners, your design team to say, hey, look, we were planning to do X, but it looks like there might be a gas line running through there. How's that going to affect the development? Can we still do it? What would, and if we can, what do we need to do or how do we need to move that? Um, timing for closing. You know, you want to factor in how much time do I need to get everything done? That includes my due diligence, my title, any uh, planning, zoning approvals that I need, and financing. You know, most commercial deals do not provide a financing contingency doesn't mean you can't get financing. It just means if you don't get financing, that is not a reason to terminate the agreement. Whereas in a residential transaction, typically speaking, you have a, a contingency that you have to get financing. Now you have to get it within a particular time period, but it allows you the time to apply for and obtain financing. And if you don't get that, then you can terminate the agreement. Whereas in a commercial deal, that's just not typical. You know, the only, you know, the one place that you may see that a little bit and, you know, we're talking about a more sophisticated transaction is if there's financing already on the property that allows for uh, an assignment of that financing. Now, you know, we do some of that but that's not very common. Now, somebody had submitted a question is, what's a reasonable time to ask for due diligence? That depends on what you're doing. You know, for condition of title, 30 to 45 days should be enough time for your title company to, you know, you should be ordering right away, getting the information back, reviewing it right away, but, with respect to due diligence, which is your inspections. Is it a commercial property? Is your lender going to require that you do a first phase environmental on the property? Um, are they going, do you need zoning? If you need zoning, you're going to need a longer period of time for due diligence because you know that process alone is going to be anywhere from 90 to 120 days. So you need to, have identified with the property, what does it need? What am I going to need? What is the process I'm going to have to go through? And if it's simply, oh, I'm buying this building as it is, doesn't need zoning, you know, probably a 60 day due diligence is fine. You know, it gives you enough time to look at the, the, the zoning for the property to make sure whatever's there complies with uh, what is operating or what was operating. Um, you know, and that's very critical and we'll get that into that in the due diligence, but you have to pay attention on those things because it's very important to know that you're expecting to buy A and you're ending up with A. So um, let's move on to the next slide, please. So, and this is, you know, we'll go through this a little bit and then I'll ask David to jump in on some of his experience uh, related to the sale, you know, getting the, getting to a signed agreement of sale. So, Dorothy, I, Dorothy, excuse me, can we go to the chat in your previous slide? We do have a question from April. And she's asking, what is a reasonable time to ask for 
due diligence or okay so you're on the agreement of sale page we'll cover that now so um as i touched on a little bit before how much time you need for the due diligence really depends on what you're doing with the property so let's start with should i use a standard form now I have to say unequivocally, I'm never a fan of the standard form of commercial agreement of sale because I generally think that it invariably something comes up that's not quite covered and doesn't really cover it particularly well. You know, I know that a lot of times people say, I don't want to use a lawyer, my broker says it's fine, let's just go with it. Um, and I can tell you, you know, I. I've had more than my share of situations where people did this and then came to me after the fact and said, you know, oh, this came up and it's not in the, it's not in the, uh, the form agreement. I was supposed to get uh, estoppels from the existing tenants. And estoppel is a certification that existing tenants will give to an owner for reliance by the buyer that says, you know, here's the critical things on my lease and I affirm that these are all correct, that the landlord's not in fault, things like that, so that you're comfortable taking over the building that you're not gonna get hit with some bombshell that uh, the tenant's rent is $500 a month, but the tenant says that it's only $100 a month and that's what they've been paying, or they think their termination date is two months from now, and the owner is telling you it's two years from now. So, you know, to me, spending a little bit, uh, spending some money drafting a good agreement of sale is how you end up spending a lot of money fighting when, you know, if something doesn't go right. So considerations for your agreement of sale is who's the buyer? You know, do you already have a, do you already have an entity established or are you going to form one? You know, typically if you're in a business, you don't recommend taking title to the property in your own name, forming an entity. You're going to want to talk to your accountant about that. What's the best kind of entity to form? in order to buy the property, am I buying it for my business, so I'm putting it in the same name as my business, and I'm forming a different entity. Those are considerations because, um, you know, the state took a position a number of years ago that people always used to put agreements in sale in the name of Dorothy Hamill or her assignee or nominee. And then when it came to closing, you just assigned it to your new entity and, you know, all was well. The state, you know, took the position that the that can be considered a transfer, uh, even though it's for no consideration. It can be considered a transfer on which you have to pay transfer tax, which nobody wants to pay extra tax. So it makes sense, you know, get it right at the beginning, and then you don't have the problem. What's the purchase price? And what's your deposit? How much are you going to put down? Typically, you want to be able to have a, um, a split deposit. You'll put down, you know, a smaller amount when you sign, and then maybe a bigger amount after you've completed your due diligence. You know, obviously, you want to put as little money at risk as possible, because in the event, you know, it all blows up and something happens and you miss your date or you get into a dispute, you know, you'd rather have $25,000 that's at risk rather than $100,000 at risk. You know, you obviously have to weigh that with the size of the deal, but, you know, you, you don't want to put so much money out there that it's going to cripple you uh, if there's a problem. Condition of title, very important. As I mentioned, you want to know what's out there. You want to know, are there easements? Are there restrictions? Um, somebody contacted me the other day because they purchased a property that has a uh, restriction in it from, I believe, PIDC. Or, 
were paid, one of the two. Um, fairly innocuous, but maybe something that you, you want to see if you can get waived. So you're going to need time for that. If you're doing a development, are there gas lanes? Are there, uh, I mean, are there gas lines running, water lines running? I need an opportunity to review that to determine how that affects my property. And, um, you know, are there, you know, somebody came to me a couple years ago, they were buying a building and a business that was a beer distributor and there was a deed restriction that <laughs> prevented the sale of alcohol on the property. Now, those kind of restrictions are, you know, that restriction went back a hundred years. So, you know, it, this business had been there a long time and had, clearly hadn't been enforced. But you need to know that and you need to know what are the risks. You know, is that still enforceable? If it isn't enforceable, is there something I can do? You know, do I want to do something affirmatively, spend the money to get it removed? If, it's, if it is enforceable, you know, is there a risk? So those are the kind of things you want to be con concerned about. Uh, when you're talking about the condition of title. Due diligence. Again, we talked about that. You, does your lender want you to do an environmental phase one, which is like an, a, a very surface environmental uh, testing? You know, you're not necessarily, you're not particularly going to do that, you know, buying a duplex that you're going to, to renovate and lease. But if you're buying a commercial building, that certainly may be a consideration. Um, do I need zoning? It's important that you look at what the zoning is on the property. Because if I've had multiple, multiple, multiple instances of people who bought properties and then went to do whatever they wanted to do and were like, oh, wait a minute. Uh, you know, this, I, this guy sold this to me as a six unit multifamily, but the city says I, I only have the right to, to lease for three units. Well, if you had, you know, if you had done your due diligence, you would have found that. So if, if you find that out during due diligence, then that's an opportunity to either go to the, the seller and say, I want a price reduction, or I'm willing to try and get zoning to get the approval for the additional three units, but I need extra time and I want the right to be able to terminate if I don't get it. But it's always important to, to give yourself enough time, depending on the scope of your due diligence, to give yourself enough time to do that. Reps and warranties. You know, these are things you want from the seller. And this is a negotiation, but it's going to be, you know, you want the seller to tell you as much as they can. Because in a commercial deal, the, the property is being sold as is, whereas you have no recourse back to them except in very limited circumstances. So you want to get as much as you can from them. You know, what are the uses? Are, are there leases? Are they in full force and effect? Have they gotten any notices of defaults? Is there any um, outstanding environmental conditions? Is the zoning, what is the zoning? Have they gotten any notices from the city? Uh, things like that. So you want to have, try and get as much as you can in those reps and warranties. Contingencies. Again, as I mentioned, financing is not a contingency that you will generally ever see in a commercial transaction, but you will see zoning contingencies, particularly if you're going to do a development, you're going to need time to get your plans done, get it approved through the city process. So you're going to want to give yourself enough time. And as I mentioned, the zoning process alone you know, at best case scenarios, 90 to 120 days. And in this, you know, in these times, you know, it, it's certainly a possibility of being longer because of people working remotely and, you know, the plan approval process. 
and depending on the scope of your development, you know, how much, what other processes are you going to need? You know, do you have major plan review? That takes time with licensing and inspections. Um, so you want to make sure that you cover any contingencies that you need in order to get your approvals to do what you want to do with the property. Default. It's critical, important, if nothing else, in the event you default, you want the sole remedy of the, the seller to be to retain your deposit. You don't want to open yourself up to the possibility of uh, having to pay damages or uh, anything like that. So that is critical. It has to be only that they get to keep your deposit, which is again why you want to limit your deposit. The flip side of that, um, uh, you want to make sure that if you're a buyer and the seller defaults, you want to give yourself the ability for specific performance. That means you don't just want the right to be able to get your money back. You also want the right to be able to pursue the seller to make them sell you the property. That involves litigation, which nobody likes. However, if you've put a lot of time and effort into finding this property, it's the right size, location, it's got what you need, you, you know, you put time into this, you don't want the seller to have gotten a better offer 30 days from now and say, eh, I'll give her money back, I know this other guy's going to pay me more, I don't care. You want to be able to say, no, seller, you made a deal with me and I'm going to hold you to that. So getting specific performance is very important. Transfer tax and apportionments. Apportionments are things like real estate taxes, water, sewer, gas, charges, uh, if there are tenants in the building, rents, and how they'll be split between the buyer and the seller. Typically, those are split on a per diem basis. So the buyer is considered the owner of the property on the day of closing, so it pays taxes, et cetera, from that date forward and gets, and the seller gets a credit for anything that he's paid that covers that time period, like real estate taxes, you pay in the lump sum. The seller's going to credit, get a credit back for that time period when it's not, you know, after the closing. Uh, transfer Philadelphia. That is particularly a painful subject because transfer tax is high. Um, so transfer tax is the tax that is imposed on the transfer of property between two people. In Philadelphia, the transfer tax is 3.278 plus you pay an additional 1% to the state. So you're paying 4.278 tax on your purchase price. So you want to be sure, you know, uh, when you're fixing your purchase price that you're factoring in your costs. And that is split 50-50. In, in Pennsylvania, it is traditionally split 50-50. Um, closing documents, those are the things typically, you know, you try and include some of the documents that you're going to have so that there's not, you're not um, disputing language. You know, the deed, if there are leases and assignment of leases and rents, if there are permits and approvals and assignment of those documents. So to the extent that you can, it's never a bad idea to attach those as exhibits so everybody knows. One of the things that is in the agreement of sale in Pennsylvania for commercial is bulk sales. And you hear that a lot. And bulk sales is that relates to if somebody is selling you their building. And oftentimes when people buy buildings, they buy 
one building in the name of one entity, they buy another building in a different entity, so there's no uh, potential of, of uh, cross defaults or uh, cross exposure. But you want to make sure with bulk sales, in Pennsylvania, you can't get a bulk sales certificate, clearance certificate before you close because it typically takes the state a year to issue that. Well, obviously that's not going to happen. So you're going to build something into your agreement of sale that says the seller is going to send the required notices to the state and then is going to pursue it. And in some instances, depending on, again, the size of the deal, sometimes you put some money in escrow to hold their feet to the fire to make sure they do it. Because if the seller, if you don't account for it, they don't send the notices, and it turns out that the seller ends up owing money, the state can actually come after you for any, any, uh, uh, any of those things. So those are all very important. I think that um, the uh, if we want to have uh, David, if you want to jump in for a minute and talk about your. So oh, sure. Um, my uh, process through the agreement of sale uh, started at PD, PIDC. Um, where I was, what I would like to say to the uh, users, that I wasn't exactly squeaky clean. Um, but PIDC was uh, able to clean me up very nicely. Uh, I found out when I went to do my purchase that I had 14, count them, 14 judgments and liens. And one of the things that I think that people uh, have a misunderstanding of is just because you've paid off a judgment means that it automatically goes away from your credit report. It does not. So I encourage, in, encourage everyone to first, you know, do the try, uh, try uh, uh, credit report, Equifax, uh, 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 TransUnion, and the other one to find out what their credit is. Secondly, uh, there's another uh, report that's sort of like a credit report on steroids called LexisNexis. And I had known about LexisNexis, but I did not know that they had so much information on David Sims or about Eatable Delights. So my journey began months before I got to a part of closing. And um, I had to go through the process of tracking people down to get uh, things uh, changed. I had to take letters to the Pathonothery's office. I had to uh, track down a bride from 10 years ago that was not very agreeable, even though I had paid my balance. Um, so I, first of all, encourage everybody six months to a year before you even seek your property to find out what's out there on you. Uh, one of the other things that I always do is once a month, Lights Catering, and I Google David Sims just to find out what's being written. Uh, the process at PIDC was one of where they really worked with me. They asked me questions. Uh, there was uh, sometimes that it was great, and there was sometimes of it being frustrating. Uh, they, it was times when I had to produce documents. On more than one occasion, um, there were times when I had to have other people submit documents on my behalf, but I will say that it was all worth it. Um, then moving forward through um, asking questions, getting documents, um, uh, producing things about my business, uh, producing information, um, having reference letters, uh, submitted on my behalf. Um, that was an important process. Um, having people vouch for the validity of my business, um, which is one of the other reasons why I say how important it is to have good relationships with people in the city of Philadelphia. Um, that's, move. that's very good. Uh, that is very good advice. Um, 
that is to know where you are from a credit perspective, because that's going to impact your ability to buy. You know, to, if you know you have things out there, get working on them. Start working on them, figure out what they are, see what you need to do so that you can clean up your credit in order to get to a place that when you're ready to buy, it's not going to be an issue. And certainly, um, as David mentioned, uh, you know, working with, you know, if you're already working with the IDC or, or you're already talking to a lender, it's certainly, um, it's a good idea to help them, uh, have them help you through it. Now, um, Marla so kindly reminded me that, you know, we're, we're getting shorter on time. So um, I want to make sure I get through everything, get to people's questions. So um, I want to address, uh, there were two questions that came up. One was, if title tells you about a gas line, water easements, et cetera, what does a survey add? A survey, while the title commitment will tell you, PGW has a gas lien on your property, it's not going to tell you where it is. And from a development standpoint, that's what's important to you, not just that it's there, but where is it? Uh, last year, I had somebody who, uh, who didn't do a survey, was doing ground up development, and found out that there was two, that the two water lines were running straight through the middle of the property where they intended to develop. So that meant then, and they couldn't change the design because of the lot size limitation. So that meant then having to go back to the water department, you know, thankfully one line was not in use any longer, but one was still in use and required the client to spend an additional I think it was thirty-eight thousand dollars to move the water line. So you know, those are things that, in a survey, are going to give you the the nitty-gritty details about your property, not just the you know the overall. It's going to tell you exactly where everything is located, where your boundaries are. Um, you know, we recently you know we had a client who owned a property for. 20 some odd years. And it turned out that there was a, that a portion of the property that they had been using and was, they bought 20 years ago was never included in their deed. And they didn't know it. So, you know, obviously fixing something from 20 years ago, you know, presents more of a headache and is more expensive because now you're having to go back to the prior owner or to the, the, the person who owns the adjoining property to then get them to agree, well, no, you don't own that property, you know, it's mine and proving to them. So, you know, these are the things that, uh, these are the things that are important as you do your due diligence. The second question was, what consideration should be made if purchasing a unit in a building with other businesses? Not all of these issues may apply. And it's true. I'm sort of giving you a broad spectrum of what may, uh, what, uh, what you may see. In the end, it depends on what you're buying. So if you're buying a unit in a condominium, you know, an environmental assessment is not going to be necessary. Uh, you're not going to do a survey. You're not going to have a zoning contingency, particularly. Um, you know, but title is still going to be important. Due diligence is still going to be important because you want to make sure if it's a, you know, you're buying to operate, uh, a bookkeeping service out of the condo is that permitted not just is that permitted by zoning but is it permitted by the condominium association so you're going to need time to look at the the city zoning and you're going to look need time to to review the declaration 
for what that per, that um, provides. So uh, some of these things we we've, we've covered uh, in these next couple slides, but um, you know we'll get into a little more detail. So if we could move on to the next one, thank you. So we talked about this. You want to know how you should buy the property. You know, does your accountant say uh, an LLC makes sense, a corporation makes sense? You know, you're going to want to discuss if you have partners. You know, what makes sense with the people who are going to be your partners? Um, and you want to, as I said, most importantly, you want to form your entity beforehand. It's not, you can actually do it online yourself. Uh, I always forget that I think the buying is $125. So to me, $125 is worth it. If you don't end up closing, you can, you know, as we say, put the, the entity on the bookshelf. And when you find another entity, you can, you know, dust that off, use it again. Uh, but having that done in advance is important. And you want to know how you're buying it and who you're buying it with. If you have partners, what's the structure going to be? Who's going to own what? You don't want to, you know, enter into an agreement of sale while you're still working out your partnership structure with your other investors um, or your other partners because, you know, that's adding, that's adding a layer of pressure to you that you don't need on top of what you need to do for buying the property. So you want to talk to your people in advance, talk to your accountant, get that squared away so that when it comes time to sign the agreement of sale, you're comfortable on the back end stuff and can focus squarely on the purchase. Let's move to the next. And Dorothy, before we go forward, we do have a question from David who asks, when you speak of a survey, are you talking about an inspection report? So a survey is not an inspection report. So a survey is somebody is going to, you're going to hire a surveyor. You know, the city has, has surveyors, but typically their, you know, their time frame doesn't generally work on a commercial deal because they need, you know, longer lead time to get out there and do it. So typically we end up hiring private surveyors. And a surveyor is going to go out to the property look at the property, look at the prior deeds, the easements, the documents that affect title, and then they're going to draw and map out the boundaries of the properties, the easements, the restrictions, so that when you look at the survey, you're going to know if there's a gas line on your property, where that gas line runs. Does it run through the middle of the property? Is it just on the edge of the property? Am I getting the full property that I think I'm getting? You know, oh, I think it's a double lot. But it turns out in looking at the prior deeds that this owner only owns the single lot. Oh, well, that's not what I thought I was buying. So, you know, you don't typically in the city see surveys for, you know, established buildings, established commercial buildings, nobody's resurveying those. And, you know, typically when we're dealing with lenders, we ask the lender to, to give us a, an exception and not need one because obviously, you know, to Liberty hasn't moved and the boundaries haven't moved in the last 50 years. So there's really no issue. It is, you know, if you're doing, um, you know, a vacant land, if you're buying property that you're going to uh, demolish and rebuild, you want to know what your boundaries are. You want to know what's out there so that when you're making your plans, it's going to match what you think you can build. An inspection report is, you can, you know, inspection reports are not always typical in a commercial deal. You can do that on your own where you have somebody who, you know, you send somebody out, your contractor or, um, 
you know, a company that does that and they'll give you a report to say, okay, hey, here's what, um, here's what's going on with the property. Here's things that you should be concerned about. Um, condition of title. We talked about these things. Title is very important. You're going to buy or you should be buying and don't ever buy property without getting title insurance. I've had too many people do that because they think they're saving some money and it turns out, you know, being penny wise and pound foolish. So you're going to find out on the condition of title, what's encumbering your property so that you know if there are any liens or encumbrances that the seller is going to have to clear all of those. Um, are there restrictions on the property that you didn't know about that are inconsistent with your proposed use? Is there something on the property that's a restriction that you want to try and get removed? So looking carefully, getting your title ordered promptly and get and reviewing it promptly are critical because in that time period of your due diligence and your title review is when you have the ability to terminate the agreement of sale. So you want to make sure that you've got that time to look at this, review it, review it with your design people, and make sure there's nothing on title that's going to affect what you want to do. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Thank you. Due diligence. Uh, we talked about zoning. That's important. You want to know what's going on, what can be, what the property can be used for. Is it permitted by right? If it's not permitted by right, what do I need to do? Real estate taxes. The most important thing I would say about that is if you're buying a property and you're told there's a tax abatement on it because the city has a tax abatement, pro a tax abatement program, you want to make sure that you get evidence of that tax abatement. You know, this comes up in a lot in residential because people think they got an abatement, they never get anything. The developer had a problem. They didn't clear some tax issue with the city and the abatement has sat, never been applied. It's a problem. So you, if, you know, there can be, you know, there's, there's abatements on commercial property as well. So if the seller is saying to you, I have a 10 year abatement for that, you want to make sure that you see that document from the Board of Revision and Taxes that says you have been approved for a 10 year tax abatement. You want to, the condition of the property, you want to make sure you're having somebody out there. You know, you don't, because you're buying it as is, you want to get somebody out there who's going to tell you if there's anything you need to be concerned about, whether there's any environmental conditions that you should be concerned about. Again, you don't find this as much in the city, in established commercial real estate. Um, if you're currently leasing, you can, you know, does, if there are leases affecting the property, you know, have you done your numbers? Did, what are the terms? You want to make sure you have a handle on that. Does anybody, does any lease for the building have a right of first offer or a right of first refusal, which means they have a right to buy the building. You want to make sure that if any lease in a building that you're looking to buy has that, that the seller is getting something from that tenant saying, I'm waiving my right or I elected not to buy because you don't want to end up in a fight. In that regard, where you spent money and now you're stuck. Uh, operating expenses, you want to look at how the building's operating. What are they spending? Um, so that all goes into your financials. Let's move on to the next. I think we pretty much co covered representations earlier. I'm just giving you on this slide some examples of the kind of things that you want the seller to tell you, that they have actual title. Nobody else has a uh, title to the property. If it's an entity, that the person who's signing has the right to sign. You don't want, you know, Bob Corporation's nephew signing when he has no signing authority. So you want to hold them to whoever signs has the right. That there's no litigation of rents to the property. What the zoning classification is, if they've received notices of any violations. 
if they've received notices of hazardous materials. Um, if there are contracts for the property, management contracts, snow removal, things like that, you want to know that and you want to have the, you want to make sure if you don't want them that they're going to terminate at the end of, at, at closing so you're not uh, on the hook for the money for those. Uh, what's the status of the leases and occupancy agreements? You want to make sure that you think you're buying a building that has five commercial tenants with five leases that have an expiration of X, Y, Z. Uh, and, you know, again, with employees, typically that's not an issue because most property, a lot of times commercial property is owned just by an entity that all it does is own. It doesn't have employees. Those are the things you're going to want to look at. Next slide, please. Contingencies, uh, we talked about financing. That's just not something typically you're going to get. Zoning, lender approval. Uh, this is one you don't see a whole lot, but um, you know, there is something in with your lender that they are going to require some sort of additional approval, you may be able to, to get some sort of contingency for that. 1031 exchange, that comes into play if you are, if you sold an existing property and you're using that money to buy this property, it is a tax deferral vehicle. So you just wanna make sure that you've incorporated that, there's nothing the seller doesn't have to do anything else or pay anything additional to accommodate that. It's just an extra document or two to get signed at closing. Environmental inspections, I think we've talked about. Um, next slide, please. Default, again, if you walk away with nothing, you want the deposit to be solely the, the remedy for the, the buyer. The seller's going to, if you default, the seller's going to, um, the seller, if the seller defaults, you want to make sure, again, that you get the ability to have specific performance. And then if you are going to get the deposit back, so that you get the deposit plus the interest. We always, from a buyer perspective, always try and get a reimbursement of expenses from the seller. Uh, obviously, the seller pushes back hard on that, but uh, you know sometimes you can get something if you're willing to cap that money. Um, uh, if you're willing to cap that money, uh, the next slide, please. And Dorothy, before we move forward, we do have one question from April who has says, "What does it mean to buy in an opportunity zone?" Also, so, I know that we're approaching 11 o'clock, so I will uh, leave that to our speaker today. Okay. The, to buy into an opportunity zone means that you're buying in a property that has been designated uh, really for development. So there are tax advantages to buying in an opportunity zone. And it's certainly something to consider. There's, again, a little bit more... Um, paperwork that goes with that, but uh, it can certainly from a, from a tax perspective be a good vehicle um, to use. And places like PIDC can help you identify those opportunity zones uh, within the city, uh, connect you with people who can help you with that. Um, the next slide, please. Transfer tax, we talked about this. Uh, I don't think we need, yeah, that's sort of pretty basic. Um, next slide is the closing documents. You know, again, these are typically things that if we can, we try and attach some of these documents to the agreement of sale. That way everybody's, you know, on board about what the documents say. What you definitely want as a buyer is a city certification statement. That is something that is issued by the Department of Licenses and Inspection that says the property at 123 Main Street is approved to use as a restaurant on the first floor and five residential apartments. 
So then you know that what you sign an agreement for is what you're getting. And what's critical here is that you want a city certification statement not showing any violations because you know sellers are typically going to say okay i'll give you a city certification statement but since you're buying as is if any violations come up you know that's on you so you want to make sure that you're asking for a clean certification statement so that once you get it you can always uh, you can always go back to the seller if you get it and say, look, I'm okay with this because I'm going to be taking down the building anyway, so it doesn't matter. But you want to make sure that, again, going in and buying, you know what you're getting and your eyes fully open. Uh, final slide, I believe is costs. So this is just sort of a, a rough, you know, hard and soft cost breakdown from a development standpoint um, that you want to consist, consider, like what's when you're doing your budgeting. And, you know, when we talk about soft costs for you as the buyer, you know, you're talking insurance and engineers, if you're doing development, any permits you might need, et cetera. But you also want to consider that if you're getting a loan, you're paying the lender's fees as well. So you're, you're, you know, are you paying any points? You're certainly paying the lender's legal fees. Um, sometimes we try and negotiate a cap on those fees. Doesn't work all the time, but they can't say no if you don't ask. Um, a fee for appraisals if the, the lender's requiring the environmental you're paying for that too. So when you're putting your, your costs together, you want to make sure that you're thinking of those other costs, which are going to come in as a result of if you have financing and then what your site work expenses are that you're, you know, you want to give yourself a cushion, you know, in working with your lender and, you know, if you're working with somebody like PIDC, they're going to help you with that because you want to make sure if you're doing some sort of development that you've given yourself enough money to do what you need to do and um, account for those, you know, bumps that come up that in the TV shows never seem to be, you know, very much. Oh, we have to change the, you know, the sink out. Well, you know, when you're doing development, anything can come up. You know, you open up walls, particularly older buildings, things come up. So there's enough stress and development uh, in the buying and developing process. Um, you know, you want to control as much of that as you can. And I think that's it. I think there's a, I think I attached a, um, you know, a sample hard cost budget, just, you know, this is in a development, uh, in a development scenario, but it even helps in a renovation scenario because you're, you know, you're seeing in front of you some of the things that maybe you weren't considering. Uh, oh, wait, I wasn't really considering that. I was going to have to replace the electric, but it's an older building. I might need to do that. You know, I'm going to, uh, I I'm going to account for, you know, X dollar, X percent of my budget to, to do that. So, um, you know, these are just things, ideas, things for you to think about as you put your plan together. And I think that's it. Dorothy, this has been an amazing amount of information. And as I said at the beginning of this webinar, PIDC has had the opportunity to work with Dorothy, representing her firm, um, as she has taken on developers who have come to PIDC for financing. So there is a track record 
of PIDC working with Dorothy. And someone asked, one of Dorothy's slides was, do I need a lawyer? And the only thing I can think of is, it's the difference between having a physician who is a general practitioner when you need a specialist. And so every lawyer isn't qualified to work in an area that is very specialized. The other, the other thing I wanted to mention is when you are buying a property, even if you are talking to the seller directly, more, more than likely that seller is simply the mouthpiece for the lawyer who has given them information. So you That's should always point. assume that when you are talking to a seller, you're really talking to the seller's lawyer. And That's so you want to make, Laura. yeah, so you want to make sure that you have legal eyes to protect your interests and don't go in naively thinking, well, the seller seems so nice. Seller's not in it to be nice. The seller's in it to make a profit. And they have professional, professional advice behind whatever they say. Usually a real estate lawyer and usually a CPA or highly qualified accountant. Those two professionals are generally working with, and Dorothy mentioned this, are generally working with the seller on their behalf. Um, so Dorothy, as usual, it's, it's an outstanding presentation, very in depth. We encourage you to, Dorothy, can they contact you if they have questions? Yes. So this well, is what we- If you have questions, uh, you can certainly email me, but I'm gonna let Marla, uh, the disclaimer. <laughs> so, so here is the disclaimer. As long as Dorothy is here, you can ask her any questions that you want free of charge. She's going to answer your question. The minute we end this webinar and cross that threshold, if you call Dorothy, she's in business just like you. And so she's going to charge you her going rate. So you want to make sure, as she said early in the presentation, you want to call her, get clear up front what it is that you think you want, ask her what are her rates? Are there options in order to engage her? But you should know that professional advice is not free. It is free while we're on the webinar, but it is not free once you cross this threshold. As soon as we log out, you're paying her going rate. Um, and, and I will say again, PIDC takes great pride in the professionals we invite to make presentations, so we stand behind. We put the full faith and confidence of PIDC in all of our presenters because we have a track record with them. We know how they deliver. We want to remind you, and Dorothy was, her presentation is leading up to this. How are you going to finance your purchase? Please make sure if you have not registered for tomorrow's part two, which is financing your commercial real estate, please do so now. Go on to the PIDC website, you must register and it is a separate Zoom link for part two than it is for today. So please, please do not try to use today's link for tomorrow's webinar, two separate links. Um, so I want to, Marla, Marla, just as I want to just piggyback a second on what you said, because I think that's such an important point about, you know, when you're talking to the seller, you're talking to their professionals. And I think oftentimes, I think people can slip into um, being comfortable because they're having a good relationship with the seller and things are you know, initially going well, even if we've signed an agreement thing. And people sometimes slip into thinking that you're friends and you're not friends. So don't ever think that, that's why I say timing is so important because you don't want to ever be in a situation where you're missing your deadline and thinking, ah, Marla's so nice, she's not going to care. Well, she is going to care because she has things she needs to do. You know, she probably has a mortgage on the property and she's told her lender she's selling or she's told her tenants 
So timing is important to her. So while it's wonderful and you should strive to have a good working relationship with your seller, don't, don't let it let you become lax or, or um, lessen your, your uh, attention to anything, thinking that like, oh, we'll work it out because, you know, in the end, everybody's in it for the business. And you can't rely on the fact that, you know, people have been nice to me. Marla, you're on mute. Thank you, Dorothy. Ah! Ah! I was just going to say, if you have 10 minutes to spare, would you be available to answer some questions for the next 10 minutes or so? Sure. Okay, folks. Dorothy is offering some free Ooh. advice from now until 1120. It is 1112. So we've got eight minutes. If you have any questions for Dorothy, please just raise your hand. We will unmute you. Here's a question from April. When is the time to get a lawyer involved at the letter of intent or after? I think it's important to at least consult with a lawyer when you're doing the letter of intent to make sure that you're not leaving something out. I think, as I mentioned when we were talking about the letter of intent, you don't want to be appeasing to the seller because he wants to sell fast and you say, oh, yeah, okay, 60 days due diligence will be fine when you know you're going to have to go through zoning or you're just going to end up then when you get to the agreement of sale, you're going to have to go back and say, oh, even though a letter of intent is not binding, you're going to have to say to the seller, oh, sorry. I really meant I needed 180 days. You know, then you're you're not starting out your relationship on the best foot. So if at least you have a a consultation ahead of time so that you know what you need to ask for that is critical, then once you get to the agreement of sale, then you can have a, a you know a full a full on discussion and, you know, start the, uh, the ongoing relationship with the lawyer. Okay, someone just asked if the webinar will be available on the PIDC website. Yes. Jasmine, if you could post again, please, the address to our blog. That would be much appreciated. I think it is www.pidcphilablog.com. I think that's it, but Jasmine is going to confirm. And any webinar that you have missed previously, you can find on that website, pidcphilablog.com. So, it is posted in the chat. So we just so got five, a question from April. What would some of the ways you could get out of agreement to get deposit back? So that's part of your agreement of sale is there's going to be, you're going to negotiate into that agreement when you can, term, when you can terminate. So one of those would be if title isn't in the condition that it's supposed to be that there are restrictions, et cetera, uh, that you don't, that you just don't want to have on there, even if they might not affect your development, you may think, well, down the road, that may be a problem. That would be a reason. During your due diligence period, you can terminate the agreement of sale for any reason. You don't have to give a reason, you can just terminate but it has to be within that time period. And that's why 
you know, the first thing that we do once we sign an agreement of sale is we prepare a key dates memo, send it out to the client, the calendar, so that everybody knows these are when things are due. So there's no issue that we've missed termination date, we've missed the due diligence date. Uh, another reason that you can terminate is if you had a zoning contingency that said, uh, it can contingent on me being able to build uh, three townhomes on this lot and you go through the zoning process and you get denied or they only let you have two and not three, then you'd have a right to terminate and get your money back. But again, it's critical as you're negotiating the agreement of sale that you put those things into your agreement so that when the events happen, you're not having a dispute with your seller it's already right in the document. Great, we have three. Okay, here's a question. Is it standard to request time for due diligence in an agreement of sale? And what's the standard time frame? I think this came up earlier, but Dorothy, is it standard to request time for due diligence in Absolutely. an agreement of sale? Absolutely. In a commercial agreement of sale, it is standard. It's expected. You know, if you're not doing, if we're not talking about development, you know, you're buying a building at 123 Main Street, that is a restaurant on the first floor, two apartments on top, that's what you're buying it. You're going to continue to use it for that. You know, probably 60 days is enough time to do your due diligence and get title. If you're doing development, then that's clearly not enough time and you're going to have to, you know, probably look at 180 days, uh, 150, 180 days, depending on, you know, you're going to talk to your lawyer about, you know, if I have to go through zoning, what's the timing looking like right now from when you file and how, uh, how soon would I get a hearing? And, you know, you have to factor in that you may go before, because you have to meet with the neighborhood organization as well. You may go to the neighborhood organization and they may say, oh, I'm not so keen on this. Then you're going to have to go back, maybe make some changes, go back before them. So you're going to want to make sure when you're talking to your lawyer that your lawyer knows the extent of what you're doing with the property so that when we ask for due diligence, we're giving ourselves enough time. And you can certainly build in, you know, I, I want 60 days, but the option to have an additional 30. But if you're going to ask for an, an additional 30, the seller may say, okay, I'll give you that option, but I want you to put a little more money up to request that option so that I know that you're, you know, you have skin in the game and aren't just stringing me along. So that's also another way to get yourself a little bit more time. And, and Dorothy, you bring up one of the most critical issues with buying commercial real estate, which is the zoning issue. And in previous years, we did a deeper dive into zoning. Hopefully when you are considering purchasing commercial real estate, it's already zoned for your use. If it is not zoned, um, then there are, there are some time frames considered like Dorothy just said, and there are some other considerations for you. Um, so make sure that you understand the zoning of the property you're, you're buying, its uses. And if there are, Dorothy, what is it when you, when you just get um, a zoning variance? If you're buying a commercial property and it has a variance on it, it's a whole different process. Um, so make sure you do your due diligence before you, or be careful when you're putting up hard money. Um, I think that's, and, and that is important because, you know, and I've seen this particularly with multifamily properties where people, you know, don't take it as seriously or as they're not looking at it in detail as they should. And, you know, properties offered for sales, a five unit, 
multifamily and, you know, people don't use a lawyer or, uh, or they, you know, have used a lawyer, but they didn't know zoning or didn't know real estate. And then all of a sudden you go to get your rental license for five units and the city says, no, you're only permitted to have three. Well, you can't go back to the seller and say, well, you told me it was five because it's an as is deal and you had a 60 day window to investigate all aspects of the property, which can, which includes zoning. So you need to confirm and be clear what you're buying, what you think you're buying is actually what you're getting. And, you know, oftentimes that's where a disconnect comes up because people listen to what the seller tells them, but the seller, you know, and it's not necessarily that the seller is, is intentionally misleading them. Uh, you know, we had a restaurant, I represent an owner who just put in a new restaurant and we thought it was a, a, a no brainer because it had been operated as a restaurant for 20 years. Well, the people who'd been operating for 20 years never had the right to operate as a restaurant. And somehow, some way, they were able to skirt that for a long time. Um, you know, so in this case, it was the tenant who was like, well, uh, uh, but, but I thought I could just go in. So we had to go through the referral process, which is, um, you know, you can be denied and either have to go through the full variance process or you're denied and it's a referral and the standard to obtain a referral is less than a variance, but it's still the same time process. So it's critical that you're matching up what you want with what is actually there or what you can actually build. So Dorothy, thank you. Absolutely. If this was, if this was billable hours, we are three yeah. minutes, we're three minutes over. Yeah. So thank you all. Make sure you go to our PIDC blog page and you will be able to access this presentation and the audio. Thank you all so much. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning at 9.30 for part two, financing your commercial real estate. So long. Bye-bye.